I had an interesting conversation recently with myself. One night I was sitting on the terrace with my eyes closed. I was watching my breath. I was feeling proud of the fact that I was meditating again. Then I thought how being proud of meditating defeats the purpose of meditating. Then this following dialogue happened. It's good that I see the ego in action in almost everything and I constantly confront myself. Well good. Good for you for confronting the ego. This gave me a momentary hit of satisfaction and pride. But wait. The very fact of congratulating myself on confronting the ego is an egoistic act. Wow. That's amazing. You even caught the ego when it was hiding behind a second layer. Congratulations. This was followed by a split second satisfaction and pride. But isn't what just happened an egoistic thought? Wow, you're good. At this point my head started to hurt. So this association, this identity, this pride, where does this come from? And how is it so good at hiding behind layers when confronted? What is it exactly? What is that which is proud? What is that which feels special? I am aware that it is semantics, but the term ego appears to take on a different form when approached from a psychological standpoint as opposed to a spiritual or philosophical one. So, it is in our best interest to properly define the term before moving on further. In his psychoanalytic theory of personality, Sigmund Freud described human personality as incredibly complex containing several components. He postulated that the three elements of personality known as id, ego, and superego work together to create complex human behaviors. Each of these three elements of personality emerges at different point in one's life. According to Freud, the combination of these elements have a profound influence on each individual. The id is a primal component of a human being. It is completely unconscious and includes primitive instincts such as hunger drive and sexual urges. The id is driven by pleasure principle and craves for immediate gratification of all wants and needs. But expecting to satisfy all the immediate urges at all times is not always appropriate. It would often result in disruptive and socially unacceptable behavior. That's where the ego comes in. Ego according to psychology is the personality component that deals with reality. Freud theorizes that the ego is developed from the id and it makes sure that the primary urges and impulses are satisfied in a more realistic and socially acceptable way. The ego operates under the reality principle. Ego is the reason why we think of cause consequence and subsequently decide whether to perform an action or not. no matter how much we want to satisfy that urge freud famously compared id to a horse and the ego to a horse rider the power of motion lies with the horse but the rider provides it with a much needed direction and guidance for example ego is the component which prevents you from running out and eating while you're hungry when you're stuck in an important office meeting super ego on the other hand concerns itself with morals and values which are usually learned from one's parents, society and culture. This is the realm where one develops conscience and a pursuit of an ideal self. Superego always tries to persuade the ego to turn towards moral goals as opposed to just realistic ones. This is where guilt and pride come in. If the ego simply gives in to its primal demands, superego can then make the person feel bad through guilt. The ideal self is an imaginary aspiration of how a person ought to be, how one ought to treat other people, and how one ought to behave in a society and so on. When a behavior falls short of the ideal self, the superego punishes through guilt or rewards by making us feel proud when we behave properly. If a person's ideal self is set with a standard too high, then they'll usually tend to feel like a failure. A person's conscience and their version of that perfect self are mostly determined from parental values and upbringing. Freud also noted that id, ego and superego are not three separate entities with clearly defined boundaries. They are dynamic and they often interact with each other to influence an individual and their behavior. 
In Freud's view, a healthy personality is determined by achieving an optimal balance between the id, ego, and the superego. While the Freudian ego is more about negotiating conflicting impulses and standards, the ego that's usually discussed in Eastern philosophy or spirituality has more to do with recognizing what the self actually is when you say, I am. Essentially, it is about identity and the perceived separation of the individual from the world. Almost all human beings think of themselves as individuals, separate from the external world. It is what our parents teach us when they give us a name. And ever since then, our individual separateness seems like the most natural thing in the world. So why is it that certain philosophies and traditions deem the ego as something undesirable on the path to the truth? and list out ways to disassociate oneself from this false identity. This could be seen mostly in Eastern philosophies, teachings, and religions. In Hinduism, there's a term called moksha, which is considered one of the highest spiritual attainments. It translates to free oneself, let go, release, or liberate. But what exactly is one being actually freed or liberated from? In a psychological sense, moksha is freedom from ignorance, self-realization, self-actualization, and self-knowledge. Moksha appears in various ancient Hindu texts. For example, Viveka Chudamani is an 8th century scripture written by Adi Shankara. The work explores the distinction between real, that which is unchanging, eternal, and unreal, that which is changing and temporal. The book outlines meditative steps towards the path of moksha. One such verse goes like this. Beyond caste, creed, family, or lineage, that which is without name and form, beyond merit and demerit, that which is beyond space, time, and sense objects, you are that, God itself. Meditate this within yourself. Hindu traditions assert that at the core of all human beings and living creatures, there is an eternal, innermost, essential and absolute something called a soul. While the central doctrine of Buddhism, Anatta, asserts that at the core of all human beings and living creatures, there is no eternal, essential or absolute something to be found. Buddhism from its very early days has denied the existence of a self. In fact, nirvana is defined as the blissful state when a person, among other things, realizes that he or she has no self and never had. It is undeniable that the mind, whether in a physical or a metaphysical sense, has an image of itself. When I have dialogues with myself, the dialogue itself is not the point of interest, but the way I refer to myself is. It often feels like I'm having an actual conversation with a separate individual. But who's having that conversation with whom? It's as if there were two entities, one which is doing things, performing actions, and another one that's perpetually watching and observing. Sometimes I even have a disassociation with the doer. I feel like long ago I put on a powerful virtual reality goggles and forgot all about them. Now I identify with the doer, while in reality I might just be watching and observing without doing anything at all. The thought that I might be a willing participant in this grand illusion hasn't escaped me, this illusion of having control and options. Once I was lying on a riverbank on a sunny afternoon. The sun was shining with all of its glory right on my face. So I used my palm to shield my face against the sun. Brilliant pale orange rays slipped through my fingers, making my palm a silhouette. It was a stunning scene, and I was mesmerized by my own hand. It didn't look real. In that moment, I was so convinced that I was watching a movie. The hand was not mine, it's a hand. The actions it performed were not mine, so I waved it in front of me, just to make sure. It felt like my mind was being tricked. I thought the only thing that's holding the whole illusion together is that sense of control. Look at your own palm even this very second with this knowledge. You might feel a slight sense of disassociation. Since I began noticing this feeling of illusion, 
Existing became a frustrating endeavor. I used to be angry at the fact that I exist. It might sound stupid, but a frustrating, powerless anger was all that I was left with. It's as if an ant went on a quest to unmask the secret of this universe. I'm aware that on a scale of everything, my powers are almost indistinguishable than that of an ant. The only thing that was left in me were the burning questions about my existence and a certain knowledge I will never find an answer to my question. Sentient existence seemed like a cosmic joke. I continued to be frustrated, angry and depressed until I learned to drink water when I am thirsty. Let me explain. I was incredibly thirsty on a hot, bright Sunday morning. I went to my kitchen, grabbed a pitcher of water and I drank from it without any thought. That's when it hit me. Maybe the answers to my questions are so incredibly simple, as simple as drinking water when you are thirsty. You don't think about it. Your body knows what you want and you execute it almost like a robot. It quenches its own thirst. Think about how many little things that you do without thinking. Your body itches, you scratch, you feel hungry, you eat. You feel cold, you search for warmth. We are used to making things complex so that we can make distinctions and function with society at large. We possess the power to think, so most of us tend to overthink, overanalyze everything. And when something too simplistic is presented to us, we reject it, as we are not used to that kind of sophisticated simplicity. This presented me with an opportunity to an alternative way of thinking or not thinking. This tiny ant's response in the face of a magnificent question, instead of focusing on the vast expanse of the outer world, I began noticing my own body. This didn't change me all that much. I'm still very fixated on the big questions, but I'm not frustrated anymore and certainly not angry. It comes out in other ways by making this film, through conversations, through art. But for now, I am focused on drinking that cup of water when I'm thirsty, eating delicious food when I'm hungry, or finding cold when I'm hot or warmth when I'm cold. There comes a great peace with this simplicity. It helped me to discover the ant's place in this vast universe. Don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever I post a new episode. I want to shout out a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters. Also to every one of you for watching my videos, liking, commenting, subscribing and sharing. Every little bit helps. I'm hoping to consistently upload videos here. I have a lot planned for this channel in terms of this series and other films and podcasts so please stay tuned. And if you like the video, please share and subscribe. Thank you so much for watching.